Hello, welcome to lecture 16 of solitons. Last time we derived the two soliton solution of the sine Gordon equation, which you can see here in equation 5.34. And we did that by uh, applying an auto backlund transform uh, uh, to the vacuum twice and using the permutability theorem. Uh, in this expression, you see that uh, on the right hand side, you have uh, the exponential of theta one and exponential of theta two, which appeared in uh, uh, two one soliton solutions. So it's uh, perhaps not uh, unexpected that this might indeed contain uh, two solitons. But uh, what we'll do today is to study the asymptotics of the solution that we uh, found. And we'll study asymptotics at uh, early times when t goes to minus infinity and late times when t goes to plus infinity. And we'll see explicitly that indeed uh, this solution contains uh, uh, two solitons. As I stressed at the end of the last lecture, uh, we have to take these uh, limits where t goes to plus or minus infinity carefully. If we do it uh, at uh, fix x, uh, what will happen is that uh, if the two solitons move uh, uh, with uh, non-zero velocity, then they will just fly away to infinity and we'll miss them. So instead, we should take uh, the limit where t goes to plus or minus infinity, keeping this combination of x and t, which I call uh, xv. This is x minus vt fixed for an appropriate velocity parameter, capital V. What we'll do today is to choose uh, this velocity parameter, capital V, that defines the co-moving frame uh, in a smart way, in such a way that that is uh, precisely equal to the velocity of one or the other constituent uh, solitons uh, in the two soliton solution. And that will allow us to um, indeed uh, identify these constituents. So I'll now go to full screen and start writing. Let's start by switching uh, to a co-moving frame. With velocity V, capital V. And so the exponents of theta i, which are equal to this sine epsilon i times Lorentz factor gamma i times x minus x bar i minus v i t. I will rewrite this as epsilon i gamma i, and then I'll write x minus capital V times t. And then I will add back again capital V times t minus v i t minus x bar i. And I've done that because now I can group the first two terms, they just give me a capital XV, the space coordinate in the co-moving frame. And then we'll have minus VI minus capital V, which multiplies time T. And then we'll have X bar I, which I remind you was uh, the position of the center of the i soliton at uh, time equal to zero. And you see here the appearance of vi minus v, which is nothing but uh, the relative velocity or the velocity of the i soliton in the co-moving frame. This is equation 5.36. Now that we have expressed everything in terms of the co-moving coordinates, capital XV for space and T for time, we can take the limits uh, where T goes to plus and minus infinity, keeping uh, XV fixed. And there will be essentially three cases. Depending on the relative velocity being uh, negative, positive, uh, or zero. So let's summarize this in the following table. First, I'll write the case. Then I'll study what happens when t goes to minus infinity. And then I'll study what happens when t goes to plus infinity. The three cases that we'll consider is when capital V is less than Vi, the velocity of the i soliton in the original frame. Then we'll have capital V equal to VI, and finally we'll have capital V larger than VI. 
In the first case, capital V less than VI, then the relative velocity is positive. So when we take T to minus infinity, uh, so we'll have uh, that the brackets will tend to plus infinity. And so there is also this sign epsilon i in front. I remind you, gamma i is uh, the Lorentz factor is positive. And so theta i will tend to plus infinity if epsilon i is positive and to minus infinity if epsilon i is negative. So I'll denote that uh, uh, by writing that theta i tends to plus epsilon i times infinity. On the other hand, when t goes to plus infinity, theta i has the opposite sign, so we will go to minus epsilon i times infinity. When uh, capital V, the velocity of the moving frame, is the same as the velocity of the i soliton, so in that case the relative velocity is zero, the time dependence drops out, and so theta i stays finite, uh, both in the t2 minus infinity and the t2 plus infinity limit. And finally, when a capital V is larger than Vi, so when the uh, frame is moving uh, faster to the right than the i soliton, then the relative velocity is negative, and we have the opposite uh, uh, signs that then uh, we found in the first case. So theta i will go to minus epsilon i infinity when t goes to minus infinity, and it will go to plus epsilon i infinity when t goes to plus infinity. So this tells us uh, a few things already. So first, let's consider the case in which the velocity v of the commoving frame is different from the two velocity parameters v1 and v2 of the one soliton solutions. So when that is the case, then uh, we are either in case one or case uh, three. And so theta one and theta two will tend to plus or minus infinity as time goes to infinity. And therefore, the tangent of u over four, where u is now the, two, the field for the two soliton solution, which I remind you was mu e to the theta one minus e to the theta two over one plus e to the theta one plus theta two will tend to plus or minus infinity or zero in this limit. More explicitly, if uh, theta, uh, theta one and theta two both tend to plus infinity, so I'll consider this as sign plus plus, uh, then uh, we find that uh, the right hand side uh, tends to zero because the denominator grows faster than the numerator. And so tangent of u over four tends to zero. If instead theta one tends to plus infinity and theta two tends to minus infinity, I will call this a plus minus case, then the tangent of u over four tends to plus infinity. If uh, theta one tends to minus infinity and theta two tends to plus infinity, then the tangent of u over four tends to minus infinity. And finally, if both theta one and theta two tend to minus infinity, then the tangent of u over four tends to zero. Please check this. All right, tangent of u over four tends to plus or minus infinity or zero. And that means that uh, u tends to an integer multiple of uh, pi over two. So when uh, uh, the velocity of the commoving frame is different uh, uh, from the two velocity parameters v1 and v2, we find that the field u tends to an integer multiple of two pi, so zero or plus minus two pi, plus minus four pi, etc. when uh, time goes to plus or minus infinity, and this is nothing but uh, the vacuum solution. So the conclusion in this case, is that uh, if we go off to infinity, in 
in the original uh, XT plane in any direction apart from uh, those for which dx by dt is equal to v1 or v2, then the field u tends to an integer multiple of 2 pi. In pictures, here is uh, the xt plane. And say so these are directions where dx by dt is equal to say v2 or perhaps uh, v1. And what we know is that uh, as we go to infinity, uh, not along these directions, we'll get to the vacuum. So essentially, the solution will be in the vacuum. Everywhere apart from uh, a region uh, in the interior of the xt plane, or uh, as we go to infinity, apart from this uh, uh, direction where dx by dt is equal to v1 or v2. Next, if uh, the velocity of the commoving frame is equal to one or the other velocity parameter of a one soliton solutions, we'll need to study the limit more carefully. And hopefully we will find a non-trivial solution, not uh, just the vacuum. In this lecture, I'll consider a single case namely where A1 and A2, the two backlog parameters of the one soliton solutions are positive. So there will be three more cases uh, corresponding to the other possible signs of uh, A1 and A2, but those are treated similarly. And so I'll leave it to you to work them out in the exercises. All right, A1 and A2 are positive, uh, so one of them will be the largest, and without loss of generality, let's take uh, A2 to be the largest, so we'll have A2 larger than A1, larger than zero. So this means that uh, v2 is larger than v1. This is because the velocity is related to the backlog parameter a as follows. So vi is uh, ai squared minus one over ai squared plus one. And this is an even function which is monotonically increasing when a is positive. So if a2 is larger than a1, then v2 is larger than a1. In addition, we know also that uh, epsilon one and epsilon two, the signs are equal to plus one because those are the sign of A2 and A1. And finally, mu, which was A2 plus A1 over A2 minus A1 will be positive. 
we need to take uh, capital V equal to V1 or V2. So let's take uh, capital V, the velocity of the commoving frame to be equal to V1 first. In other words, uh, we'll write the, the slower soliton, which is soliton one. Okay, then theta one, which I remind you was equal to gamma one x minus v1 t minus x1 bar uh, can be written as gamma 1 times x minus v1 t is the same as x minus uh, capital V times t and that's the commoving uh, um, space coordinate x capital V or let's write this x v1 and then we have minus x1 bar Theta two, on the other hand, was equal to gamma two times x minus v two t minus x two bar, and we rewrite this as gamma two times capital X v one minus uh, the relative velocity v two minus v one times t minus x two bar, where the relative velocity v two minus v one here is positive. This is equation 5.37. And so in the limit where t goes to plus or minus infinity, keeping the co-moving uh, coordinate x v1 fix, uh, we find that theta one stays finite. And uh, theta two tends to minus infinity as uh, t goes to plus infinity with the uh, x v1 fixed. That's because the uh, relative velocity v2 minus v1 is positive. And when time goes to minus infinity, theta two tends to plus infinity. Good, let's analyze these two limits uh, where t goes to plus and minus infinity when with the x v1 fix uh, uh, in turn next. One of the two limits uh, turns out to be easier. So let's do that first. And that will be the limit where t goes to plus infinity. Then as we've uh, just written, theta two tends to minus infinity which means that exponential of theta two tends to zero. And therefore, if we look at the two soliton solution, we had the tangent of uh, u over four, which is equal to mu e to the theta one minus e to the theta two over one plus e to the theta one plus theta two. And this tends to mu times exponential of theta one because e to the theta two tends to zero and uh, the denominator similarly tends to one. Now let's write uh, e to the theta one in terms of the co-moving coordinates. So we have mu e to the gamma one x v one minus x one bar, which is a constant. Now it's convenient to write this in terms of the original uh, x and t coordinates to understand a bit better what is happening. So let's do that. Uh, we get uh, exponential of gamma one times uh, uh, the co-moving coordinate was x minus v one t. And we have minus x one bar. And then uh, we write uh, uh, mu in the exponent by writing mu as exponential of log mu. So we have an extra term plus one over gamma one to um, cancel the gamma one in front times the logarithm of mu. So here I write log for the natural logarithm. Okay, so this is the expression in X and T coordinates.
And this is an expression that uh, we recognize. Uh, this is nothing but uh, a kink moving uh, with velocity v1. along uh, the following trajectory. So the center as a function of t will be equal to v1 times t plus x1 bar. And then there is a shift uh, because of the uh, log mu term we we'll get minus one over gamma one logarithm of mu, which I remind you was a two plus a one over a two minus a one. This is equation 5.38. Now the argument of the logarithm uh, is larger than one. I said earlier that uh, mu is uh, positive, but in fact, uh, it's even uh, larger than one. And so the shift here is negative. So we find that the center uh, of this kink moves uh, along the trajectory that uh, it would have uh, followed uh, in the absence of the other kink. So that's x1 uh, one bar plus v1t. But then there is a backward shift due to this uh, uh, log mu correction. Next, we look at the other limit uh, where t goes to minus infinity. In that case, uh, theta two tends to plus infinity, which means that exponential of theta two also tends to plus infinity. And therefore the two soliton solution tangent of uh, u over four, which was again, mu e to the theta one minus e to the theta two over one plus e to the theta one plus theta two tends now to minus mu e to the minus theta one. Uh, so why is that? Well, the e to the theta one term in the numerator is um, subleading. So in the numerator, we get minus e to the theta two. And in the no denominator, we have that uh, e to the uh, theta one plus theta two still uh, tends uh, uh, to plus infinity. So when we take the ratio of e to the theta two with uh, e to the theta one plus theta two, we get uh, e to the minus theta one. All right, we have uh, this minus sign uh, in front of mu and the exponential. Uh, we would like to get rid of that uh, because eventually we want to write minus mu uh, in the exponent. Uh, and uh, uh, we'll do that by recalling a trigonometric identity. the tangent of uh, a plus minus uh, pi over two is equal to minus one over tangent of a or minus uh, cotangent of a. So this means that uh, the tangent uh, of u over four plus or minus pi over two that's equal to minus one over the tangent of u over four that we uh, just looked at uh, earlier. So this will tend to mu to the minus one exponential of theta one, which uh, has a constant limit in uh, co-moving uh, coordinate, but let's uh, directly rewrite it in terms of the original x and t coordinate to uh, get a better intuition about what's happening. So this is exponential of gamma one times, uh, so from theta one, we get gamma one times x minus v one t minus x one bar. And then uh, I'll uh, uh, move uh, the mu to the minus one prefactor into the exponent by subtracting minus one over gamma one log of mu.
Remember, the log of mu inverse is minus the log of mu. Good. So therefore, the limit uh, of u, say when t goes to minus infinity, keeping uh, the commoving coordinate x v1 finite, is, uh, uh, okay, so we'll have this plus or minus pi over four. We move it to the right-hand side and we multiply by four. So we'll get plus or minus two pi. And then we have a plus four arc tangent uh, of the right-hand side in the previous expression, which is exponential of gamma one X minus V one T minus X one bar minus one over gamma one log mu. But we have this uh, plus or minus sign ambiguity, which came from the trigonometric identity. And this can be fixed uh, by continuity, so by requiring that uh, the solution u is continuous. And when you do that, uh, uh, the answer is that uh, minus two pi is uh, the correct choice. So we'll pick the minus sign there. And now we recognize that uh, uh, the expression that we just found for u in the uh, t going to minus infinity limit in the co-moving frame is uh, again a kink moving uh, with the velocity v1. It's a kink because the sign in this exponent is uh, plus one uh, and it has velocity v1 and it moves uh, along uh, the following trajectory. the position of the center of the kink at time t, we see from uh, this expression here is equal to v1 t plus x1 bar plus one over gamma one logarithm of mu, which was a2 plus a1 over a2 minus a1. So when x uh, uh, takes this value, then the exponent uh, is zero. That's the center of the king. And now we see that uh, the shift is positive. So we have a forward shift compared to the position that this kink would have had in the absence of the other solitons, uh, in which case uh, the quantity which I have uh, encircled would not be there. So if we compare the trajectories uh, of this kink, uh, which moves uh, with velocity v1 at uh, early times, uh, meaning t going to minus infinity and uh, late times, meaning t going to plus infinity. We see that the collision has uh, shifted uh, the slower soliton backwards by a finite distance, which is two over gamma one logarithm of a two plus a one over a two minus a one. 
So I find this by subtracting the position of the center at the t going to minus infinity from the position of the center at t going to plus infinity. So we say that uh, the slower soliton which moves with velocity v1 has a negative phase shift. So the phase shift of the slower soliton is minus two over gamma one logarithm of a2 plus a1 over a2 minus a1. So the picture to have in mind here is the following. So let's uh, draw the trajectory of this slower kink in the xt plane. Had we just considered a, a one soliton solution with the slower kink, that would have followed the trajectory where x uh, is equal to v1t plus x bar one. This would have been the trajectory of the center uh, of this kink. But now we know that at early time, the kink uh, uh, in the two soliton solution, this lower kink is actually ahead of uh, that trajectory. So it would be somewhere here. Where this is uh, one over gamma one log A2 plus A1 over A2 minus A1. That's the forward shift. Whereas at the late time, the kink is behind the trajectory that it would have followed in the absence of the second kink. So now we have the exactly the same shift, but uh, now it's backwards. So this is uh, what we learned by looking at uh, this uh, asymptotics. And then uh, in the middle, something will happen. And we'll see more about that uh, uh, later when I show you plots of the exact uh, numerical solution. So to summarize, by looking at uh, uh, the asymptotics when t goes to plus or minus infinity in the co-moving frame, which moves uh, at velocity v1, the same as uh, the velocity of the slower soliton, what we have found is that uh, the slower soliton, which we identified as a kink, did emerge uh, from the collision or from uh, you know, what happens at finite t. with the same shape and velocity that it had at early times. But uh, it's delayed by a finite uh, phase shift. Good, next we need to look at uh, the other case, case two, which is when uh, the co-moving frame moves together with uh, the faster soliton. So capital V is equal to V2. And as we see, what this achieves is that uh, we will be riding the faster soliton. The algebra here is very similar, so uh, I'll let you look at this in an exercise, which is exercise 30. So you just have to follow the same logic uh, that uh, we just followed when we took uh, uh, the co-moving frame uh, uh, with velocity v1. But uh, you'll find a surprise.
when you do this exercise. And the surprise is that even though the backlog parameter A2 was also positive, so that uh, acting on the vacuum with the A2 backlog transform gives uh, a kink. So, uh, in spite of that, uh, the part uh, of the two soliton solution that uh, moves uh, with the velocity v2, that moves at velocity in v2. ST goes to plus or minus infinity is in fact an anti-kink. So the lesson here is that uh, even though the backlog transform always adds a soliton, The nature of the added soliton depends uh, on what uh, was already there before we add the soliton. You will also find that the phase shifts of the faster soliton have uh, uh, the opposite sign to before. And so the picture is the following, again in the XT plane. This uh, Say is a trajectory of a soliton moving at velocity v2 centered at uh, x2 bar when uh, time is equal to zero. So this would have been the trajectory of the faster soliton in the absence of uh, the slower soliton. But now we find that this uh, soliton is now an anti-kink and uh, at uh, T going to minus infinity, it's behind the trajectory that would have had uh, in the absence of the slower soliton. Whereas uh, when time goes to plus infinity, it's uh, ahead. And the shifts here are given by one over now gamma two logarithm of uh, A2 plus A1 over A2 minus A1. And the same uh, uh, when t goes to plus infinity, but now uh, this is uh, advanced. And once again, there will be an intermediate region where time is finite where uh, we don't really know what happens, uh, at least not yet, not by just looking at uh, asymptotics. But I'll show you some uh, plots shortly and we'll see that the uh, anti-kink does something like this. So to summarize here, the faster soliton has a positive uh, phase shift. which is equal to plus two over gamma two, the logarithm of mu, which is a two plus a one over a two minus a one.
To conclude this lecture, let's look at a few plots and animations of a two soliton solution that contains a, a kink and an anti kink. So here is a, an example uh, I've taken as a backlog parameters A1 to be 1.1 and A2 uh, to be 2. And this is a plot uh, of the solution. So the vertical direction is the field U. And here is X horizontally, and uh, this is time. So what we see here at fixed time, say at the beginning, so we have uh, an anti-kink and that follows a kink. And the anti-kink is faster than uh, the kink. And at some point the two uh, solitons collide. And after the collision, we have a kink which follows the anti-kink. So the slower soliton, the kink, is now behind the faster soliton, the anti-kink. And as you can perhaps see from here, the trajectory of the anti-kink before and after the collisions are parallel, but they're not quite the same. And the same for the kink. To get a better picture of the trajectories of the kink and the anti-kink, it's better to look at the contour plot of the energy density. So here it is for the same two soliton solutions. So here, Light regions have a high energy density and uh, uh, dark regions have a low energy density. So uh, wherever you see blue, uh, there the solution is approximately in the vacuum. And here, uh, this is uh, one of the two solitons and this is the other soliton. So you see this one is the faster soliton, which is also a lighter color. Uh, that was uh, in our case, uh, the anti-kink. And this is the slower soliton, which is the kink. And here you can see clearly that uh, the slower soliton, the kink here, has a negative phase shift. So um, as a result uh, of the collision, it is uh, retarded or delayed. Uh, on the other hand, the faster soliton, the, uh, which in this case is the anti-kink, is advanced as a result of the collision. And uh, we say that the anti-kink has a positive phase shift. And finally, notice that uh, from this contour plot, uh, we can uh, get a better idea of what happens during the collision. So uh, it looks like the kink and the anti-kink are getting uh, closer to one another during the collision. So they seem to attract uh, each other. I'll say more about this at the beginning of our next lecture. Finally, uh, let me show you an animation of the time evolution here it is. So we have uh, the anti-kink following the kink. And now they're about to collide. And uh, now the anti-kink is uh, ahead of the kink. All right, that's all for today. Uh, have a good weekend. I'll see you on Monday.